Cool. Ooh. And then um, I'm going to let everybody in. You can get settled and Kristen, you can start whenever you want. So I'm letting everybody in right now. Okay, thanks Beth. Thank you, Beth. Mm -hmm. Thanks Beth. <laughs> You're welcome. Beth. Oh, oh my Beth. God. Oh my gosh. Oh, whoa. Oh. Humans. Hey people. Mm -hmm. Jenny Oppenheimer. Minutes, everyone will get started. And just Is that Jenny? Yeah. She's, she's, she's connecting to audio, so she may be able to hear us now. Let's see. Hey. And there's Megan. Hey, Megan. Hi. Hi, Megan. Hi. So we'll give everyone a, another minute or so to join cool. and settle and pour a cocktail. Great. A cocktail, which I always... Cheers. I unmuted <laughs> myself, honey. No, mom, you need to mute yourself. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the woman who used to get candy from Sam G and Con. I wish she would unmute herself just so she could say chocolate for the rest of us. Yeah, she joined one of our events on last week and was talking about God knows what Amanda was like, I think your mom's mic is on. And I said, it's cocktail hour there. I have no clue what she was talking about. <laughs> it was. I can hear yeah. you. I know you can hear me, mom. <laughs> <laughs> That's the point. Uh, that pleases me. Katie. Wow. All right. <clears throat> Be nice to you. Mother. Uh, Keep yourself muted. <laughs> Thanks. I've got this. I poured for you, Jan. <clears throat> All right. Shall we get started? Sure. Okay. Yep. Well, welcome everybody to those who are new to Exile in Bookville. I'm Kristen, and together with my business partner, who's in the other room doing a podcast, Javier, we run Exile in Bookville. Um, we were an online bookstore for seven months waiting for COVID to get the hell over itself. And then we just bought this beautiful store three weeks ago. So welcome. You can gather by our name, Exile and Bookville, that books and music are our identity. So we're incredibly thrilled to celebrate the paperback release of More Fun in the New World with co-authors John Doe and Tom DeSavia, and they will both be in conversation with Exile VIP Gia DeSantis. So if you don't know who John Doe is, um, I think that's a little weird, but he is a founding <laughs> member of the legendary punk rock band X. And if you don't know who X is, then I just can't help you. Okay. He is a co-author along with Tom DeSavia, of Under the Big Black Sun, A Personal History of L.A. Punk. Um, and their audiobook version received a 2017 Grammy nomination for Best Spoken Word. And they are also co-authors of, obviously, More Fun in the New World. Um, Tom feels like a friend now. Um, we've been corresponding via email. So email is good for building friendships, obviously. And he has way too many accomplishments and various titles in the music industry to name here. Um, but some of them include former a &R head of creative services for Songs Music Publishing and six years as VP of a &R at Electra Entertainment. He's also served on the board of directors for the Songwriters Hall of Fame in the West Coast, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, and the National Academy of Recording Arts and Sciences. And Gia, uh, Gia DeSantis is family. She is not family by blood, but we are even closer than sharing blood. Um, she means the world to me and I can't believe we get to have her again. Um, Gia is the former producer and host of KDOC TV Los Angeles's Request Video an on-air talent at K-Rock Nevada, and Nevada's NPR uh, music station, NV89, and a label executive at Capitol Records and Reprise Records. She is currently working on a documentary about request video and can be seen on Access TV's Music's Greatest Mysteries. So if you have any questions for Gia or Tom or John, 
feel free to type them into the chat or you can use Zoom's raise hand function um, near the end of the event and more fun in the new world is available for purchase in our store. Um, you can purchase it through your uh, link that I'll provide in the chat or on our website and we ship all over the country. Um, John and Tom have been awesome to uh, sign some book plates. So we'll send some signed book plates along with your copies. So um, that's enough talking about me. Cheers to everybody. Have a Cheers. cocktail. And I'll turn this over to Gia, Tom, and John. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Kristen. Thank and congratulations on the new space on Michigan Avenue in Chicago yes. in the Fine Arts Building. I'm very proud of you and very excited for what you guys have going on. It's, it just opened three weeks ago. Um, so yay you. Um, hi, you guys. Hey, fellas. Vodka. Hey. hey. <laughs> Um, I, I think that anytime anyone mentions the Grammy nomination, we'd be remiss in not mentioning that y'all lost to Mrs. Wiggins and nothing more punk rock than <laughs> losing to uh, you know, Tim Conway's nemesis. Um, hey, hi, let's talk about the book and about some music and, and stuff that's going on. I'm super happy that there is a paperback book that comes out because it will um, means that the, the spelling of my name from the first copy from the hardcover copy will be fixed. Uh, Tom. I need to actually say so yeah, <laughs> I, I misspelled your name with a D-I instead of a D-E like mine fixed it, and then for whatever reason, got the paperback, opened it up, and they decided to hyphenate your name and split it between two lines. That's, you know, whatever so it takes. But it's spelled correctly. But that's, we're, yeah, that they, well, thank Christ for that, because it was always like in every music industry, <laughs> like you know, directory or something, it was, you know, DeSantis, DeSavia, Divine. So hi, Tim Divine, if you decide to, to type, um, pop in here. Um, and I also want to mention that X has an album that came out last year, Alphabet Land, produced by our friend Rob Schnapp. Um, and it was the first time in over 35 years that all of the original members of the band were together in studio recording new music. Please correct me if I misspoke in any way, shape, or form. No, that is all That is all correct. Your, your all research. Right. You've done your research well. Good job. Oh, thank you. You a a plus so far. Thank you. So far, that's that's what we got. Yes. And I was really lucky to be there for some tracking one day, and that was that was a huge right. honor for me. Um, and uh, you know, and this is a huge honor as well. And in talking about the book hardcover version that I have, um, I also want to mention that the actual the audio version. While I implore you all to buy the hard copies of the book to also listen to the audio book because that is, I think one of the greatest things that any of us can do is hearing everybody talking about these stories in their own words, with their own inflections, John listening to you or to Jane Weedlin singing um, a cappella, the songs that you are so well known for is, is a gift. And I really, really, really recommend that. Um, so here's the question that's been in my brain so much about this book, in addition to Under the Big Black Sun is, what stories did you have submitted to you that made your jaws drop? Um, I, I didn't know uh, Tim Robbins' story of, of um, all the shenanigans that the early actors gang got up to. I mean, I, I went to one or two productions when they were on Santa Monica Boulevard uh, in a really small space in the back of a, a storefront near the uh, uh, supply store, the Army Supply uh, Surplus Store. Yeah. And, um, but I had no idea that, that, that he had been exposed to, to that so early and, and was doing, you know, kind of flash mob things. Um, that was really surprising. Um, uh, what else? Uh, I, I wasn't surprised, but I was uh, by Maria's story, uh, except the the Maria the, McKee, uh, Lone Justice. Maria McKee, just Maria McKee of Lone Justice, and the and the uh, 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 gauntlet that she had to to suffer through, uh, being a woman, being someone who was you know young and taken advantage of by by pretty much everybody, and and mm -hmm. you know. I, I mean, I was there and, and, you know, 
saw some of it happen, but I had no idea the depth of, of how uh, brutal that was at a time when, when people didn't really pay attention to that, um, right. which is unfortunate. But uh, I don't know, Tom, what about you? I mean, it's the, the same for me. It was the Marine <laughs> thing, but unlike John, I wasn't aware of it. It was just as I was becoming a fan. And so everything I saw was, you know, really you know, glitz and glamour at the time. I thought this band was, you know, they had a record deal. They were, they were playing bigger venues. It just seemed like yeah. this, this yeah. idyllic situation. And to find out. <laughs> and, then, and then you yeah. showed up at the, at the Palomino and there's a whole different band. Yeah, exactly. Well, that was it. He was like, "Yeah, you strange." I wonder what <laughs> members would be being. You know, just they, they would slowly disappear. But it was. It was a re really um, just honest, uh, very unapologetic telling of her story. I thought so. She was really like, you know, take no prisoners. But she, she, she let it have. Let's have it. And yeah. women, it, especially like in those earlier days, and one of the things I loved about the first book is just is hearing so many female voices. And the um, and so I guess, John, my question to you is, did it, was it conscious that there were a, a consciousness about the amount of women who were playing these integral roles in the scene in Los Angeles, or was it just kind of a given? Like they're here and we're, we're doing this thing and it just so happens to be someone with the opposite sex or was it like, how, well, how did that play out? Uh, well, we didn't have a, you know, a, a quota right. of, you know, male versus female or, you know, it was just basically who, who was, <laughs> who was still around. <laughs> that's that's first <laughs> who's still alive and then uh you know who has a good story to tell and and who would people like to hear from and and who could we get a phone number from and you know the the uh, the scope of it got pretty big and, and we were we were lucky that, that we could get people that weren't just musicians not just mm -hmm. but people that weren't musicians to contribute to because that um that was an idea that was that was given to us by uh, one of our uh, attendees, Chrissy T, uh, saying, "Well, what about the people that were influenced by this music, not just the musicians?" So um, we with Shepard Ferry and Tony Hawk and, like I yes. said, Tim Robbins, Alice, what, Allison Anders, and, Allison, uh, right? Um, I'm blanking on who else, Tommy. I think those were those four were our our our, 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 our seed catchers. As yeah. it were. Um, There's one, one more, I thought. But yeah. anyway, yeah, I, we didn't have a quota with women, but, but uh, you know, obviously Pleasant uh, Gaiman wrote an incredible chapter of the first book, and so she, we wanted to have her back. Obviously, Jane and uh, Jane Wheedlin and Charlotte Caffey, you know, went from rags to riches in this era, so that was mm -hmm. pretty obvious that they would be included. Um, yeah, it's just like who had a good story and who's willing to play along. And, and we were really gratified by everyone wanting to tell their story um, and, and be, you know, use their own voice and be honest and, and uh, you know, give people a little bit of dirt. The scene, like, like Jane's story about, was it, morph was it morphine um, up her bum? Like um, that was, or opium, <laughs> opium up the bum. Same thing. Like, oh, that sounds like a good time. That <laughs> <laughs> You bet it is. <laughs> Who doesn't want all that action? Um, the, but, but during the time, like actually in the 70s, early 80s, when, when the women were a part of that, did that change when the Orange County scene started to come and sort of infiltrate what was happening because I remember something well Rollins actually brings up um kind of good point and this is no slagging on my Orange County punk friends many of whom are incredibly like intelligent and far more well-read than I am and all of the good stuff but Rollins says something like you know you guys were the ones who had you know library cards and and who read you know were really smart and then this <laughs> this like dude thing comes along from you know south of the you know on the five or the 405 did that change women's roles and and what was happening in hollywood for sure uh, i mean it was it was harder to uh, you know, there wasn't there wasn't anyone like, uh, um, you know, uh, 
oh god kathleen hannah saying girls right. up front you know right it just wasn't it just wasn't there yet so yeah the <laughs> i mean we didn't we didn't suffer from that too much because we had already kind of established our audience and and we the hardcore kids didn't like us that much even to begin with you know right so so that was uh but yeah there was a lot fewer women in the audience especially up front because who wants to suffer that kind of abuse <laughs> no not yeah well and Xene, of course now is is it, you know, as I'm going through my stuff and I, you know, I just think about it being a kid growing up and listening to you guys. And, and so right now, thinking about you and Xene and being legendary, right? Or having you know, the icon um, moniker attached to what it is you've done and what you bring. The, the beauty in that is that you have people showing up to shows who are you know, 15 to 70, or listening to the music and finding it just by virtue of, you know, their parents knowing who you are or the, and the word icon and the word legend going. And so artists mm -hmm. like Skating Polly, you know, being in this world and touring with you guys, do you feel protective of them, of the younger artists? Uh, maybe a, a, a bit. You would have to ask Xene because she's, uh, I think, closer to Kelly. Right. Um, and uh, personally, yeah, I mean, if they're if they seem to be making a, I don't know. I mean, they're 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 grown ups. They're 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 going to decide what they want to do, and and they have a, you know, most people have a pretty good handle on on how they want to conduct themselves. And yeah, I'm I'm not gonna, <laughs> I I tread very lightly on that, especially I mean, even with my own children. So. Yeah. Is this mandatory okay. reading for your own children? So you have three daughters, right? You have daughters. Yeah. No, it's yeah. not mandatory. No. Have they read our book, John? Mandatory reading for my kids. Kid. Read our I, book. I, I don't know. I think I'm pretty sure they read the first one. I have no idea. <laughs> you think, that would be I would the, make it mandatory. That would be the worst thing to say. So, what did you think of my book? Oh, like, yeah. oh so you, God! We have different parenting styles then. Twenty-three-year-old, yeah. a twenty-one-year-old, and I'm just like, yeah. so tell Mama what makes her cooler than you right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, uh, I I think it's it it is uh, a, a great gift to to have young people coming to the X show, to have like young people wanting to take their moms and dads to the X show. I think that's pretty sweet. Right. In a you know in in an old fashioned definition of sweet, it's tender, and and uh, caring and stuff like that. Um, yeah, I don't want anybody. If somebody fucked with any of the people in skating, Polly, I would uh, you know be mean to them, and I would tell them exactly what I think. Uh, I might introduce them to punk rock, which uh, could have <laughs> consequences, and. Uh, but it's it's rewarding to see a lot of young people, young women especially, um, taking a page from the early punk rock days, right. and and starting bands. And I I've said this before. It's kind of like women who are in you know uh, like uh, punk rock, whatever it's called, um, summer camp. You know what what Tom help me out. Uh, rock. Rock camp. I know what you're talking about. What's that thing called? Girls rock. Yeah. Rock and roll it's fantasy like, camp. It's sort Whatever of like that. that but it's but it was geared mostly towards punk rock. And and they were that that's been 15 to 20 years. Uh that's or at least 15. And young women who are, you know, 10 or younger were going to those rock camps and you know getting schooled by punk rock women and right. now they're 20 something and they've got some kick-ass bands that's that's very rewarding to see it's, I, I feel protective of the skating poly because they stayed at my house and i yes. remember telling my daughter i would let you date a drummer it could be curtis and then he slept <laughs> in her bed she wasn't here so i was like well yes. so <laughs> <laughs> it's different than we expected um, yes. Tom, tell me about getting Shepard and Tony Hawk and, and Tim Robbins. And did you draw them in? Did you like 
cast that line and bring no, it No, um, it, 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 all these folks knew, um, I might have brought like Chris Morris. <laughs> right. All these people are John's old friends from, from, from years, years back. But it was funny, as, as you were saying earlier, when, when we were writing part two, so part one is the evolution of uh, the beginnings of LA Punk, 77 to 82. And then the second book, when we got, which, which only sort of happened by accident, I think when John and I got the book deal, we were like, oh shit, we got a book deal. What are we going to do? After we got the deal, we're like, we have to figure out how to write it. And I think it was John's idea. It was like, well, let's just focus on the first five years because then it's a easier time frame to tell. And and so when we were asked to do the second book, it was logical, the time frame. we do the second half. But when we started to put the book together um, or the idea of what the, the storyline would be, it was just a real downer. It was sort of, well, heavy metal one, the end. Right. And... We were, we were just kind of trudging forward doing that and getting a couple of chapters in. And then it was Chrissy, our friend Chrissy, who uh, served as our creative consultant on the book. And she, she had noted on the first book how many people had come forward and uh, said like they had the punk rock spirit sort of motivated them to go forward in whatever career they had. And so with Shepard specifically, it was funny. We were, and I got this a lot because I wasn't there at the first book, but my opening intro was me telling the story of my first X show and feeling incredibly out of place, but feeling incredibly part of something. And, and, you know, the, you know, the, the switch flipped inside my brain that there's this, okay, there's this other world out there and there wasn't streaming. There, there was just what your friends had. And, you know, and so I told the story of my, my punk rock awakening and then shepherd like a lot of people came forward once like went wow your story was my story right and people that were my age going like i had the exact same experience and that's when i realized you know not surprisingly it was a real shared experience for folks so when when chrissy asked when when chrissy suggested that john reached out to shepherd who said yes immediately um allison anders uh who john had worked with previously in a couple of films as well uh i forget how um tim came into the picture did you just know tim from coming to shows john no i knew tim robbins through uh mostly through the um through the pearl jam camp oh right okay yeah and I mean, did they approach I, I, you I had, him, did... I, I had met him through some other like uh, hollywood actor types on the on the you know in the in the b range the solid, the solid b range of hollywood actors like at that earlier actors gang, but we never really connected. And then he would come to Pearl Jam shows. And so then that we got way we got to be friends. Um, the, so the, obviously, but you had the first book, you got the second book. And tell us why there won't be a third book. You have two great kids. You don't want to fuck it up. <laughs> <laughs> We're destined to have, have an asshole. Um, <laughs> No, the, the, the first two, and we sort of decided this going in, that we had a story to tell that was, that was pretty honest. And the first one, I got to be the fan. The second one, I got to be the fan, but I actually sort of participated. I was going to shows at that point. When John was in town for the first book, mostly, and for the second book, he was mostly on the road. But so we got to tell this whole perspective of sort of being there and these 10 years that accompanied it. It, doing anything beyond it would would be we, we haven't really talked about it to this sort of depth but I think would be both of us sort of stretching um the natural abilities of telling a story right yeah yeah I, I wasn't I, I wasn't really um in, engaged in the LA music scene at that point we were you know I had moved up to the grapevine um, mm -hmm. starting to have a family and, and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, it, it, it's somebody else's story to tell. They could, they could, um, option, they could, they could franchise the, uh, <laughs> you know, presented by under the big black sun. Well, right, but, right. but at like, that like point, a, like, like where <laughs> could you see, I mean, I, obviously we could see it, but who would you, who comes to mind if you if you thought about obviously you're gonna have like a Wayne Kramer right or it, like you know in someone in New York like what other cities are deserving of this treatment 
And who would oversee it? Like you guys oversaw it. Yeah, I mean. Uh, the, oh I mean, God. answers. I mean, That's, all of them. I, I don't know. I, don't all, know. I mean, the, the, the one thing I hope this does, and look, we were inspired really um, by, okay, well, I'm gonna draw a blank on it. The great New York book um, about please the New York. Me. Please about kill the me. bathroom? Yeah. Yeah, okay. no, please kill me, which was just such a, a great way of telling the story. And we sort of took that, we changed the the the, the narrative and the um, perspective of the authors to, to chapter length. But it was a really, I thought it was just a really great insight because none of us were there. You know, we all knew about it, but just to really get the you were there thing. And for me, I mean, I hope that this, spawns everybody in, in those cities to write a book because I'd love to know the DC story beyond what I know. I'd love to know the San right. Francisco story, which we were able to touch on sort of, we sort of cheated a little bit and went, well, it's a right. short drive. So we'll, we'll get it in there a little bit, but yeah. it, we didn't touch the story, you know? Well, there is a, there is a good San Francisco book and I'm looking at my bookshelf right now. Uh, give me something more. Uh, by Jack Bulwar and I uh, forget who else co-wrote it. That's a good one. Oh, give, get, give me something better. Sorry, give me something better is, is the early days of San Francisco punk rock. And that's a good book, but that's, that's more, um, you know, uh, interview and uh, hearsay. It's, it's, it's not as a, it's, it's not written from the perspective of the people who were there. It's just Jack and, uh, other people calling each other up and say, do you remember with this? And do you remember that? But that's a good book. Um, and um, I, I, think, on... I think one of our other inspirations was, well, you know, not to uh, disrespect uh, another LA history book, but uh, give, uh, we got the neutron bomb had a lot of inaccuracies and, and I, I was there and I know that some of the stuff was exaggerated and just flat out wrong and, and things like that. And so, you know, we wanted to have something that would be a little more fact-checked and, and, and not just working on the sensational aspect of it. Right. And it, which, you know, and just a quick, again, like we're talking about more fun in the new world, the follow-up to Under the Big Black Sun for Exile and Bookville, Exile and Bookville um, based in Chicago. Uh, just opened up their brick and mortar um, three weeks ago. I'm super proud of them. The book is Yay. available. The paperback is available through Exile and Bookville. And if you purchase it, um, you'll get a nameplate signed by DeSavia and Doe um, together again at last. Yes. Um, the so you know talking about the revisionist history, right, and coming in and and fixing, righting the wrongs, as it were. Um, uh, Chip and Tony Kinman, I need to bring them up because uh, you know, I, I am very, very lucky that even though like I you know, was poking around in the punk rock world and was close enough growing up in Long Beach and Lakewood that I, um, you know, if my friends ditched me or my girlfriend Shelly and I had some spare time because our boyfriends had better things to do, we'd go find a punk show and like lift ourselves <laughs> up over the fences and peek over to this thing that was terrifying and intriguing at the same time. Um, and then I started doing this you know, TV show that was based Orange County, but it was the LA shows. John, you were on it. And I have an adorable photo of us. We're an adorable couple and I'm like 22 years old. Oh my gosh. Um, on the set of that show. And, but the person who came into my life who taught me so much was Chip Kinman. And he'd called and, you know, I was like, hi, my name's Vomit and I want to be on your show. And we became very, very good friends. And, and of course, we became good friends with Tony and Tony Kinman, Tony 19, uh, Rank and File, The Dills, Blackbird, Ford Maddox Ford, um, became ill, right? As I, it was, I think it was as this book, this second round was beginning. And, um, and, Chip sat there at Tony's bedside as he was dying and corrected the record, as it were. And I think that there's a, a passage, John, in in one of your chapters that that touches on that. And of course, you know, they were a band that had gone into San Francisco as well. The Dills did. But can you talk about the importance of having that record corrected? 
Uh, well, it was Tom who who really encouraged Chip to uh, cut the story down. I mean, I I said absolutely because uh, rank and file were one of the best uh, versions of early Americana. Right. Period. I mean, songwriting and production and just like style and and the whole thing. So um, take it away, Tom. Well, I was going to say to log roll here a minute. I I met. Chip Kinman because of you, Gio. That's how we met. And I was a massive, massive, I knew, I knew rank and fell before they knew the deals. Mm -hmm. And when I was just getting into the scene about then, I was just, I was just completely taken with the cowpunk, we called it then. The cowpunk scene. And I loved, you know, every every band that, you know, played a G chord. Um, but with Chip, it, it was it was they were really one of those bands that a lot of people didn't know and their their influence was was pretty strong i mean john talks about it in a chapter like you know you may not know marie mckee but you know nico case you know and, and uh, right. all these bands and, and and rank and file and the bills were just a, you know a really 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 important band for me personally i i, I did one chapter just on buy i remember buying that record vividly you know, I don't remember anything else from that year, but I remember going into the record store. I remember getting the nod from the clerk, like, there you go. Not the usual crap you usually buy. Like, this one's okay. <laughs> you know, it was on Slash. It, it was just a shockingly, like, graphic graphic cover. Uh, not graphic. Uh, section. It was, a, it was the, right. the graphic right. was, it was memorable with the yeah. barbed wire and, yeah. And it was, you know, the, the most, you know, tragic thing to lose lose Tony at such an incredibly young age but I love the fact that he and Chip sat together as he composed this chapter and he knew that you know whatever little way he was he was he was getting a little little bit of immortality through it and I think um I've had a lot of people come to me since the book and went like like wow I love rank and file wow I love blood on the saddle I never knew these bands existed because if if you weren't regionally living around here you might not you know, it's, they're not like easily to, easy to find records. They're not, you know, there wasn't a million of them. So they're not sitting in the used bins. So yeah, just personally, I love, and I just became very, very fond of, of Chip and, and, you know, so, so glad he was a part of this, so. And you and I, we were dates for the, um, it, it's such an odd thing to say, and I, I regret saying that out loud, but uh, we went together to Tony's with, Memorial With, with skating poly, so we like chaperones, the kids. Right, we did chaperones yeah. <laughs> we, at the first Linda Linda's show too. And it was the first Linda Linda's, Linda's show. The very right. first Linda Linda's show. We were there. Um, but the, the, the thing about that memorial service and the old school punk rockers that came and they were there. And I mentioned this in a book, our friend Brenda Perlin, who has compiled stories for the called Crime and Punkishment. And, and she has another one that's coming out that I forgot to write a chapter for. Um, the, there was an elegance to the old guard punks that spoke to me when I left that day, just the, the, like the most beautiful human beings all there together and the lives that they'd lived. It was, um, it, it was extraordinary. And so when we go back to when sort of like LA punk, it, as you knew it, John, sort of fizzled out. And then you go on to like the hair bands coming along. And I'd mentioned to Tom um, in a conversation we'd had how it was kind of like the, the um, tortoise and the hare. And only for this was like the hair, right? The hair bands. But the <laughs> you guys, your story, I, I feel, is um, it, it's it's a longer, richer history of music than what Great White brought into the picture, for lack of a better term. Um, but do you ever get kind of cranky over the fact that? Like those were the guys who had, you know, more like financial reward for, frankly, a lot of it was just shit music. But I mean, does it ever like, is, is it ever a, a, a bee in her bonnet? As no. I'm sure you wear many, but. Never. God, um, I love you for that. Cause it uh, pisses me. Well, off. I mean. <laughs> uh yeah, I, I I wouldn't I wouldn't change the uh, reputation or 
what sort of influence we've had or you know how well i sleep at night or or just the fact that and you know there were other people that that are influenced by uh you know guns and roses and and right. uh motley crew and things like that but i'm um, yeah if if that had, if that <laughs> i don't know well, it's I, wouldn't funny. Be, I, I wouldn't be doing this if if i had um you know the if I had wasted as much money as uh, probably Axl Rose has, <laughs> right? I, I would be say, sorry, sorry, I'm surgery. I'm busy. I'm I'm busy right. shopping. I'm busy doing fun things that I think are I, you know. Yeah. So yeah, I, I'm I'm an artist, and uh, artists don't always have a big bank account, and I do right. I do great. I, I'm I'm very. Uh, you know, happy with, with where I'm at and, and I get to do a lot of, a lot of interesting stuff. So it's, right. it's that's, funny. that's its own, own reward. When, when we were in it, like you and I, Jim, and, and seeing shows. Yeah. I would, you're not thinking about things in terms of history. I just saw stuff in terms of like, you know, the political party I, I don't like is now suddenly in power, you know, so I was, right. I was pissed off. And I remember thinking, Oh, this sucks. This sucks. But what was interesting is not that that then like years later punk made this comeback, but you know it's it's sort of like this thing. I just noticed like you know, the the records stayed in rotation, the, mm -hmm. the the bands a lot of them kept touring or the artists in some way or form kept going that it never went away. And like anything else, you know, like you know, you might be sick of superhero movies, but there's always some kind of good art film happening or some kind of good rom com or whatever you like happening on this. Subfloor, and then every once in a while they sort of burst to the burst to the top. And what I love about the punk rock scene, and and especially now, I mean, we joke that it, it's now wine and cheese. You know, the 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 most right. books we sold had nothing to do with Rolling Stone; it had everything to do with NPR. You know, it was funny when we had like our single best day sort of stuff with that. So, so the audience has become you know more more more. Uh, uh, it, it, wider and sophisticated, but I, I just love the fact that it never went away. And what I love even more, and, and, and this was really illustrated when we were doing the book tour on the last one, or whenever I go to see, see X, or whenever I go see, you know, any incarnation of Keith Morris or whatever he's doing, or, or Chip or anybody, there are, the audience is, is literally a, a, a makeup of all these audiences. It's people that were there mm -hmm. at the beginning and there's all these kids, like every, the thing I've never not seen in my entire like existence since I was 16 are, are, are kids walking up dressed like Xene. It just has never right. stopped. There's always this group of kids that, that go through this, 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 this phase. And I think it's great. I mean, it's just and, never. And let's, yeah, yeah let, let's not forget that, that the hairband phase lasted all of about four years. And then Nirvana Pearl Jam and Alice in Chains mm -hmm. just said, sorry and it was like okay who actually won you know because right. they were all influenced by um by punk rock and there's a there's a part in bill morgan is the other person who who is right. a right. filmmaker right that was influenced by by the punk rock movement and there was a, a story that he tells in his chapter where they would only have four copies of the unheard music, the, the film about X. Right. And they would send them to right. like one city Country. and it would, mm -hmm. yeah, it would play in New York for, you know, a week and a half or two weeks maybe. And then they, then they would send it to Philadelphia uh, or then they would, you know, go to Chicago and then they would send it to Kansas city because they only had four copies of right. the film it was all film and they had to send it to each different theater right but seattle kept getting held over and they're going like what the hell's going on in seattle and this was in like i don't know 86 or something like that and he found out from kurt cobain and some other people of that scene is that they were all going to watch the decline of western or uh, the unheard music mm -hmm. and saying oh this is these are artists and they mean what they you know what they say they're, they're, they're you know we're not preaching but we're you know trying to teach lessons and so forth so yeah 
We well, didn't actually lose. Yeah, and the thing I, the thing <laughs> I do, and, and gee, you probably saw this a ton, especially considering your show uh, at the time, which was which was re a pretty regional in focus, except for mm -hmm. you know, green bands that came through, is when I was a kid and you know, you'd, you'd meet people from out of state and you'd talk about these bands you liked, it was in a lot of cases was like talking about the restaurant that's on the corner. They had no idea. And like, so there wasn't a, you know, growing up, you know, the, the, the discovery thing was really your, your, your friend's record collection. There was no way to stream. Right. There was, you know, limited play. I mean, it was really Rodney on Caro Q here in Los Angeles mm -hmm. was the um, major way you'd hear sort of independent and local bands. But, you know, I, I growing up as you'd meet friends, you'd be like, oh, do you know, you know, the Circle Jerks? Or do you know them? Right. You know, they had no idea. And now I love that these bands are known internationally. That's the, the change that I've seen is that, you know, this, uh, you know, the you know, bands like X and, and, and such were, were doing pretty significant touring even back then. So they had a little more recognition, but no one knew who, you know, the, who bled on the saddle were, you know, and now <laughs> people do. No, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt. Oh, no, that's it. That's it. And so but is there a kind of a, a love-hate relationship for you guys where um, like social media and technology and YouTube comes into play that that it's it's so broad. I mean, the, the beauty of that is, of course, it's exposed to more people, but that you can't recapture that essence again or do you feel like I, or am i missing something because i you know no. school me if i'm missing something about that it can happen again well do, do you mind if i take this one johnny sorry i didn't don't mean to Go for it, Tom. we do were it. just we were just i was just talking to someone about this today and i said you know we we're talking about just that very thing about how you know we didn't stay inside because there was only you know x amount of channels and during the part of the day it was all soap operas and talk shows so you'd go outside and but had there been an internet, <laughs> I would absolutely be, I have been all over it. I would have been one of those kids like glued in my room to a, you know, a, an iPad. Had there been a Spotify and had there been a way for me to go like punk rock, let me hear everything, mm -hmm. I would have, I would have done it. So I don't hate the technology at all. I, I, I love that I grew up in a period of discovery where I would only hear what I could afford to buy, which was mm -hmm. real limited or my friends had. But I don't know that the experience is any better or worse than a kid who can get everything because you know what I wanted was everything. <laughs> so I think there's a lot of white noise out there. I think that's the only gripe is I, I don't think as uh, that, that since every Mac comes with the ability to record a record, I don't necessarily think everybody should. I'm not necessarily, I don't know. I, 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 I will vouch never everybody yeah, should. Yeah. Mike Watt and I split on that, but, um, but yeah, I think it's, Great. I think anything. I I love that. Yeah, I wish they were getting paid. That's my great. Right. I wish music. I, yeah, were I'm, paid. I love that their music is readily available and never goes out of print. Um, sure. I'm, so for I'm of that time, and and I want to talk about Fishbone for a second because there was it, there wasn't it. It felt to me growing up and and you know during that time because it, Tom, it's your opening line of. The first book of, of um, Under the Big Black Sun of I Wasn't There is, like you said, it's the story of so many. And and there were fewer girls, because I was a girl then, um, who, you know, were at these things where I think were intrigued by it. But I was just kind of pissed off and, and you know, watching the misery go around my junior high school or my high school whatever and so a band like Fishbone that comes along is very political and very forthright about racism and and whatnot it, it's it, you know the the music from them seems so current now given what we're all going through is uh, so talk to me about some of the bands that were you know hy hyper political then who could fit in to what's going on now um, I, I would say the most political was uh, were the Minutemen, but that was in the more in the first book. Um, the, that was another aha moment for me uh, is knowing all the the bullshit that Angelo had to suffer uh, yep. living up in the valley, because their their music actually did not reflect that, and and they you know they they had to uh, didn't have to, but they chose to just be 
themselves and be exuberant and be positive and say, holy shit, I've got this um, opportunity. I'm going to take it and I'm going to do the most with it rather mm -hmm. than, uh, you know, being a bunch of vinegar, they were a lot of honey and, and they, they rose above a, a lot of the bullshit that they experienced as people. And, and, uh, but hearing his story in, in uh, more fun was, was kind of, uh, it's not surprising, but it was, I didn't know the extent that he was, that he was going through shit. Um, yeah, I am. Yeah. Tom, you got anything to add to that? No, I mean, look, it was, yeah, I mean, you know, a lot of my politics were, 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 were based off, were based off listening to the bills early on, but it, it was, it was one of the things if I could, if I could do one quick shameless plug. Uh, so both books do have audiobooks that were produced by this great guy named Scott Sherritt, who got every author who wrote their chapters to read their chapters in the book. Mm -hmm. And in this, in this book, we had, uh, I think just to um, uh, Fishbone and Henry Rollins, where instead of writing proper chapters, John interviewed them. Right. And so, so the good. interviews were transcribed in the books. Mm -hmm. And so when it caught time to do the, the audio book, we're like, how do we do this? We we're just gonna have them reading their answers. And so we opted just to discuss fresh interviews, sort of staying along the same lines, but mm -hmm. both those are, are, are kind of different perspectives on like, do you, so you get like bonus chapters in the audio book from, I think it was just Rollins and Fishbone, right, Johnny? Yeah. So did, yeah. Right. And so both of them are different, but to hear, as John said, and it is one of the great aha moments because as a, um, you know, a, 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 a white kid growing up in the Valley, I, I I wasn't thinking about race, you know, I just wasn't, you know, and, and you were just like, this is a kick-ass band and never realized just how bad it, it got, you know. It's, and, it's, and, the, and the fact is, is that they didn't exist on their own. That's another book if someone, you know, is so inclined that could totally be written is the story of the, of the mod scene, the, the kind of two-tone right. scene that the untouchables were part of and, and Fishbone, um, the other bands are escaping but there was There's a, a two-tone film coming. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So they, they you know, they, they were taking a, a page from Madness and the Specials and Selector and things like that, and 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 doing, you know, some pretty righteous uh, ska um, music, and and uh, that was a, you know, that was a great scene, and and uh, we didn't feel like we could tell that story. Because it was just one one too many genres to include in uh, right. you know one book. When you look back at the, if I were to open up the you know the back of the book and start going through like you know which pages can I find you know Tom DeSavia on which artist which band was sort of the lowest I don't want to say lowest common denominator but the the common denominator for all. The, the largest chunk of the participants for both books, which band was most influential, do you think, other than X? Because that's obvious. And so many people mention X, but who else comes up in that that story? There were oh, two. Oh, Tom. <laughs> yeah, there were two. In the first book, and this this shocked me, um, just because I wasn't aware of, you know, they never had a record up, but the Screamers. Screamers. So in, in both books, uh, I should backtrack real quick, we, um, none of the participants read each other's chapters. So when we got, got them in, that was where we saw the common denominators that ran through everything, but we didn't tell anybody like, hey, Pleasant, Jane wrote this story, you should write your version of it. It just sort of came in like that. And in the right. first book, it was easily the Screamers who finally have their, their first record officially released. Uh, yes. Like three weeks ago or a month yeah, ago. Three weeks like ago. Really so recently. Yeah. Have, the demos are released. But, um, but that, that I didn't know. That was one thing I liked. You know, from my every every, you know, dumb punk rock book I've ever collected and read, and every TV show I've read, I never knew. I was like, wow, all of them love the Screamers, but there were no guitars. You know what I mean? But what an amazing man! And for this book, uh, it was Top Jimmy, Top Jimmy and the Rhythm Pigs. I think was the most discussed, wouldn't you say, Johnny? Uh, yeah, or the or the Go Go's. I mean, or the Go Go's. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, and then I'm gonna right, right, I'm gonna ask this question, and while you're answering, I am going to pull up some of the questions that come to us. We've got 
30 yes. questions in chat. Um, which song, somebody posted this on Facebook last week and I thought it was a great question and I knew exactly where to go with it, but which song do you, or songs, plural, if you ever, if you could have a photograph of your face, the first time you heard a particular song, what would it be? And I'll just, I'll start with, uh, there were two for me. It was Rock Lobster, because it was just like, holy shit, what's that? And <laughs> the opening chords to Hungry Wolf, because it was like, that's cool. <laughs> so what, Hungry what brings Wolf. it, why well, pull up these? Hungry Wolf, I remember that one vividly and then it would be the first oh pretenders goodness. album probably when first one sweetheart pretenders album oh is it when a cute heart practice. called you sweetheart <laughs> when you put on your glasses you went very Penny? but uh precious when i heard precious by uh the right. pretenders i think that was yep. the first time i ever heard a girl say the word the f word so, so <laughs> i'm i'm bad at that uh helter skelter too oh, yeah yeah i I think maybe um, uh, when I heard uh, uh, the Minutemen, uh, Bob Dylan wrote propaganda songs. When I heard that whole song, it was just, it blew my mind. That's and, and probably, um, I don't know. I'm, I'm think, trying to think of something from, from this era uh i'll get back to you on that okay i've got some questions for you guys if you've got a couple of minutes yep. uh terry is asking which bands did you get super excited to go see in here and what are you into right now go tom oh god there's i mean right now i'm trying to think like um i like this band idols a whole lot mm -hmm. i like this band shame from the uk a whole lot she, I just saw Shame, I, well, two years, now it's uh, two years ago, I saw Shame at, um, no, I'm thinking Shame. Sorry, carry on. <laughs> the Shame are just punk this little proper, little proper snotty punk band. I, I, I quite like them a lot. Uh, the aforementioned, we can't give them enough uh, airtime. I love Skating Polly, who just released mm -hmm. a video from one of the songs from their last album. Um, gosh, there's a lot of good music out right now. It's funny, because that's the one thing is when, when, when lockdown started, at the beginning, I couldn't listen to new music. My brain wouldn't wear that way. And I was just listening to a lot of comfort records. Mm -hmm. And then about six months ago, I just, I, I probably listened to more new music than I have in the past like decade. And I'm just, I, you know, talent loves, doesn't leave the gene pool. There's some really great stuff coming out. And a lot of it, it but there's, I think it's a really, look, I, I, I'll just add this one thing in that, that Gibson and Fender, I believe both sold more guitars in the last year than they have in any year in their right. history. So I think in about five to 10 years, we're going to see a, a uh, sort of the baby boom of, of, of really great artists come out. I had a friend <laughs> tell me there was a shortage. I think that she has a friend who works for, for one. It, it, it's not Fender or, or, um, or it, but it's anyway, she was saying that there was like a shortage. They were just going crazy producing. Wow. Yeah, guitars, which That's is great. Funny. There's um, this band called was... Snail Mail. I like a lot. Sorry, I just went through that in. Okay. Snail like, Mail. Snail Mail. Yeah. It's good. Yeah. We're good. Why, why can't they just call it male? Well, it's just a girl, too. Okay. So she's snail male, but songs okay. called Heat Wave, and it just like went poof. She was like, she's like 18. It's really, really great. Okay. Uh, I think one of my favorite artists is a, a woman named Sunny War. Uh, she's uh, local in LA, and she has a, a amazing way of playing guitar and uh, singing, writing songs. It, it's a a little reminiscent of um, Elizabeth Cotton, who wrote uh, Freight Train years and years and years and years ago. But she's not as folky as that. Um, I would also say Micah Nelson, is, uh, who goes as Particle Kid, uh, is, is a new right. favorite. Taking notes. <laughs> Write that down. Sunny War is, is amazing. Um, who else have I listened to? But I was always excited to see the Blasters. And anytime I could see the Blasters, uh, and, and still, uh, anytime I can see Los Lobos, I'm excited. Um, even though sometimes the, the show is like not as good as I've seen them before, it's, there's always something. 
that just blows Dave's chapter. I giggled through Dave's chapter because having worked at Warner Brothers, you know, in the yes. building at, at yeah. Reprise, like I, yeah. it resonated with me. It's a great, um, great opening, a, a great opening to a, to a good story. What a yeah, great, it's yes, great writer. so fantastic. You need to write multiple books, yeah. Um, Megan, who is part of the UCLA Library Punk Collective, my daughter is a UCLA hey, grad, so eight clap, go Bruins. Um, she wants to know if each of you could pick one artifact, real or imagined, to represent LA punk in such an archive, what would it be? Oh, Lord. Uh, Billy Zoom's Sparkle Gretsch guitar. Like it. Uh, yeah. I, I think it's called a sparkle, <laughs> sparkle jet, to be specific. Sparkle jet. Um, um, go, Tom. Yeah, well, that's a tough one, Megan. Um, can I say, can I say his guitar too, or is that a cop out? <laughs> no, you can say whatever oh, you like. You can't like. say that. You can't say that. Pick um, something. Pick something I, of, uh, of of Maria McKee's. Okay. Yeah, she had that love song Gibson with a with a kind of cross on it, and I always yeah. thought it was the coolest thing where she. It was the first time I saw someone like 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 have a guitar sl slung that low, and she just sort of play it like she was sort of punching the air down. And I thought that 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 was a really great little Gibson. So so Marie McKee's that's, Gibson. That's sexy. I mean, really, it's really sexy. sexy. Really sexy. Um, Amanda wants to know. I'm curious to hear about the best show you've ever been to, or something of the top in the top ten um, that you would feel compelled to talk about right now. That's for you, John, specifically. Yeah. And then uh, Tom and I, our, 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 our answers might matter according to Amanda, but not as much as maybe <laughs> okay. yours. Okay. Uh, wow. Well, uh, it would probably be one of the replacements uh, shows that when they were opening for us in the Midwest, probably 82 or 83, something like that. Because they they could be like the best band in the world, right? Uh, and at that point, they they weren't quite as um, uh, uh, surly about you know pissing people off and everything like that. So, yeah, yeah. I have a great picture of Tom and me at the replacement show at the right. at the Palladium. I mean, that is, that's that's, of, that's that of, this, so of this genre, but right. you know, I'm, I I saw. Jimi Hendrix when he had just put out um, Axis Bold as Love, you know, and there was a thunderstorm that was threatening to like blow up the, the whole, you know, outdoor, semi-outdoor place. So yeah, that was, and I saw the Rolling Stones in like 1966. So yeah, I've seen a lot, I've seen a lot of good shows, but. Um, What's the most insane this, event that stopped a show for you or prevented you from seeing a show? Oh, the, well, that's easy because we played at this um, kind of cow palace in Salt Lake City. Right. And they had erected a, a barricade out of plywood and two by fours. And it was probably, you know, the place could have held five, 10,000 people, but there were, you know, a solid 3,000 or at least 2,000 people there. And they're all pushed up against the stage. And as we walked on stage, the, the barricade collapsed against the stage. So all you heard was the, was the sound of nails being pulled out of two by fours, which is like that, you know, that high pitched thing. And this thing just went, you know, it had a space of six or eight feet where the security was walking in between to right. keep the kids from jumping up on the stage and it just went like like that against the front of the stage. That was harrowing. That was like, and we had to walk off stage and they had to, you know, pull a couple of security guys out that had gotten crushed. And yeah, that was horrifying. <laughs> oh, <that's laughs> luckily, awful. luckily nobody, nobody was, uh, you know, seriously hurt, but that sound, uh, yeah, I can still hear that. Um, that's awful. It was, um, it was intense. I like so glad I asked. <laughs> um, uh, Dave said Howard Parr just put out a novel about the um, or around the on club, which is cool. Oh, um, cool. Uh, hey, where are we here? Any knitters records in the future? Oh, you never know with the knitters. Okay, that's good. <laughs> and then Terry wants to know also: Did you ever watch public access shows featuring punk rock music? 
Oh, well, there was, uh, you know, what's his name? Um, what was the what, what was the, uh, the 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 original? Oh, uh, yeah, uh, punk rock show, video something. Yeah. Uh, yes, I did. The guy who was murdered, Peter <laughs> Ivers. Peter Ivers. Um, yes, Peter Ivers, and I forget the other guy's name who was his partner. Yeah. In crime. Yes, I did. All right. Do I remember it? Obviously not that much. <laughs> Um, I, because my friend Scott is on this right here. Hey, Scott. Um, I, when we're talking about like cow punk and stuff, I'm recommending Orville Peck because Orville Peck is like dear to my heart. But he's a sub pop guy. He was at Warner Brothers. Was a sub pop guy. He's, still, <laughs> he's a sub pop guy and um, lots of good music. You guys, our hour is, we've come to our hour. And really oh, quick, just for completeness, I just realized in my head, I think I said Marie McKee was playing a Gibson and it was very clearly a Fender. So oh. anybody that's- that's that, you the, saved the, your ass there. For the throngs of people that are gonna write hate mail. Right. Yeah, it was, a, it was a Telecaster, I believe. Yeah. Yes, okay. You guys are, are so good. I, again, um, Exile and Bookville, thank you so much, Kristen Gilbert and Javier yes. for Buy the book, buy the book from us. Exile and Bookville, right over there. And, and just, get a nameplate. Oh, Pointer name, yeah. A, a, a sign nameplate. And if you are in Chicago, plan on going to Chicago, please, please, please go visit our friends, Kristen and Javier, um, in the Fine Arts Building on Michigan Avenue. I have chills thinking about how proud I am of what Kristen is doing. Um, Tom, one of my best friends in the world. I, this is like cocktail hour uh, with you. John, it's a pleasure to see you again. Um, if anybody has any other questions or anything, I'm sure if you send it to us, we'll do our best to get it to you. And a thank you to everyone for participating and being a part of this. If your friends missed it, tell them that they'll be able to find this recording um, on the Exile and Bookville website on their YouTube channel. Um, and Kristen, I see your face back. So please tell us things. I just wanted to say one thing first. Tom, I'm bummed and John that there isn't going to be any follow up to this, but I, I think that my mother, and please don't unmute yourself, mom, to respond to this, but- Unmute yourself, Jan. I think, the, uh, I think that's why I'm an only child because you stop at perfection. Right. <laughs> there you go. So I just wanted to say that. And, and also, I, I don't know how we got so lucky to have all of you tonight. It was incredible. I am so honored. I was texting Gia before this that, you know, I lecture in, as a living, I'm a professor, and I was so goddamn nervous for yeah. this. And she was like, well, it's just one of my best friends and, and one of the biggest punk rock stars that's ever lived. Why would you do this? <laughs> And I said, thanks, Gia. I'm going to go pour a very <laughs> stiff vodka soda right now. But I, I don't no know. No pressure. How... Way to go, Gia. I know. Yeah, I, thank I, you. I don't know how we got so lucky. I don't know how we got this beautiful bookstore. I don't know how I had Gia move next door to my parents and, and she meets the two of you and you write this fantastic book and that we got to host you. I am so lucky and so grateful to all of you and to everyone who attended. And thanks so much for such a wonderful evening and, and for letting Exile host you. It means the world to us. You are so, are you're so awesome. welcome. And, and I'm, I'm sorry that we didn't get to more of the uh, chat questions, but uh, yeah, we'll, we'll pick it up somewhere on the it road. It was an organic event and a, a lovely conversation. So that's yeah. all that matters. Oh, uh, cheers, fuckers! So much. You are I so cannot correct. Wait to visit the store. <laughs> I know. You have, next so time, happy. next time you're in Chicago, we'll uh, we'll have a cocktail waiting for you. Or if any of you are yeah, hanging out at my house, we'll go over to Jan's house, uh, to Kristen's mom's house for it. Um, you guys, thank you so much, Dave Downey. I love you for participating, Scott, and John, and Dave, and Tom. I again. Thanks, Gia. So many thanks. Thanks, Gia. Thanks for hosting. All right, you guys. All right, we'll see you soon. Thank you, everyone. Right yeah, you will. Mwah. So long. Bye. See you, everybody. Thanks again.